And speaking about that, currently right now, I'm teaching a summer program at Philly Cam. And I have 10 students, five of mine, I teach at Fells now, and I have five from some other schools from around the district. And what we're doing is we're preparing to go out to do the DNC. So I told them that one of our first news stories we were going to do was we were going to do a story on the east side steps of the art museum because people call them the Rocky Steps. Their re reaction was, the Rocky Steps, why are we doing a story on steps? This is the, what's, what's so important about steps? So I kind of just led them into it, said, you'll, you'll see. So we went to the um, east side of the art museum, and we stood, stood, stood around, and we watched the bus, the tours come out, and people get off the bus, one after another, and they all get off the bus, and they run up the top of the steps, and they jump, saying, Rocky, Rocky, some kind, not even being able to speak English. Rocky, Rocky. And they have no idea. So you ask them questions, you know, Rocky? And they say, yes, yes, Rocky. But they can't even speak, speak English. And I relayed to them. I said, understand, the reason why this is so important to them is because of a fictional character they've been seeing for over 30 years. So understand this. Images travel. So when you think about your own image and what you put out there, that travels. So, and it was, I, I could see the aha moment in some of their faces saying, OK, I understand now. So when you put out you know, ratchetness, People send it to you, see people as, you know, ratchetness, as filmmakers, and as people when I let them go, because that, as now, is very structured on what I want them to create. I, you know, later in the program, they're going to get to create what they want. But I want them to be, understand that you're going to be independent filmmaker. Now and going forward, you have to think about what is it you're doing and how, that's, how that may affect people around the world. And I will never try to tell them what to create or what not to create. But I want them to have, you know, Ralph Edelson says that social responsibility as far as what it is that you're putting out there and think about our, because everything that we do in life either has a reward or a consequence, everything, nothing, and everything counts. So is what you're putting out going to have a reward or a consequence? And at times, you know, we, I think many times filmmakers, well, many of us feel this responsibility as far as what we create. And some of them don't care. But a lot of times we have this responsibility of what we create because we think, if I put this out there, how will this reflect upon society? And it gets to a point, too, where I understand some of my filmmaker friends say, can't we just make silly, fun stuff? You know, how come everything we have to do always have to be so, you know, so important? Can't, you know, can't we just do something silly? I mean, you think about a movie like Soul Plane, and some people's argument was, it was just junk. You know, I mean, Naked Gun is junk, but nobody jumped on Naked Gun. You know, but the, but the difference is, and my own opinion is, the problem is all we typically see from our, from the, the African diaspora that, that's in a, in a corporate setting is always one of two things. It's either really ridiculous, goofy um, stuff like, like um, buffoonery. It's either low, low income, bombed out ghetto violent stuff, or they tend to have the really high end, um, very well to do um, people with this high drama type stuff. But we often don't see everyday working people. And I never thought about that myself when I wanted to create my TV show. I just made a show. So my show, Heavy Sedation, is a African-American urban science fiction show with comedy. So that sounds weird because it's different. It didn't really fit into a box, which I'll talk about. But it was a show where, if you think about In Living Color, like the Keenan Ivory Wayne show, and you think about Twilight Zone, if you blended those two things together, you would have my show. So it's, it's sci-fi, and it's funny, and it's weird, and we get silly. And um, if you ever watch Monty Python, anybody here watch Monty Python? Monty Python? So Monty Python is almost like smart guys doing silly comedy. So we, we break this really deep intellectual idea and then just let it be really, really silly. So in saying that, when we, in, in creating the images that I did, I just, made a, I just made a show. And some of the strangest, I always thought it was so strange that I always get a lot of compliments on saying much for creating a show that shows regular, everyday, middle class black people. I'm thinking, like, this is science fiction. This is, like, the most ridiculous stuff. Light switch, I turn off the sun, you know, just the most, you know, crazy stuff. But it was, it was an idea that it showed, I think, people, regular, everyday people kind of being involved in, you know, in this kind of thing. So just saying, furthermore, as an independent filmmaker and creating a show like this, I did not fit in one of those three boxes. I was not, you know, the silly, goofy stuff. Unless I wasn't, you know, bombed out ghetto stuff. I wasn't the high-end drama stuff. So... I had a very hard time financially, a lot of times, finding those, those underwriters or finding those people who would support my show. And they said, well, what it's about? It's a comedy, it's black science fiction. And they're just like, OK. And they didn't get it. And the strangest thing was the show was doing very well. It started here in Philadelphia. It went off nationwide. It was on 48 TV stations across the country. 
um, after we did really well all over the country, we finally got picked up at HYY here in Philadelphia. And as well as the show was doing, and I had more stations picking it up, I still just had the hardest time getting any kind of underwriters to fund the show. And I could show that I had all these viewers, but because I did not fit into a box, because, you know, corporations, society think in boxes, we don't know what box to put you in. So I'm not going to put my money in here because I don't know what's, what's, how this is going to go. So I took a financial toll by not fitting in a box. But as Alan Edmonds said, this is my passion. You know, I don't do this just for money. I, mean, I like making money. Trust me, by all means. My wife likes it when, I'm, when I can bring home a check every now and again. Um, but I do this because I truly love what I'm doing. And you have to be true to what you do, but you also have to be responsible for what you put out there. So and, and saying that, I, as an independent filmmaker, I have a, a blog that I started that I don't keep up very much called Surviving Independent Filmmaking. And what it's about is that to do this, you can make money as an independent filmmaker. It's not like, you know, so people say, if you're going to be an independent filmmaker, you can forget about ever making money, you'll always be broke. Um, and especially being an independent filmmaker, making stories that you find that, that, you know, lights a fire in your own soul. So for me, I, what I have found to do is this. In that quote statement, the thing was cultural equity is to create things that are important to me and then go out and share with the masses as many as people I can and people will find, I find audience who's like what I do. So I've been in the field in doing this since 1992, since I was age of 19, I'm 43 now. I've been fortunate over the years of constantly creating and meeting with people that I have found the audience who like what I do and they actually follow me and wait for my next project and you know, that audience is what supports what it is that I do. Um, I would love it if I would get, you know, big money like anyone else, but at the end of the day, I have to look myself in the mirror. I have to look my wife in the mirror in the face. I have to look my one-month-old baby in the face. And I have to say, you know, because I have one of those kind of brains, if you can tell by how fast I talk, I'm trying to slow down, that my brain never stops. It just runs, runs, runs. And if I have something bothering my conscience, I can't sleep. So I have to be able to sleep. So for my own personal health, I have to stay to my own moral standard so that I can sleep at night. So with that being said, I wouldn't have it any other, any other way. Um, I would say, by all means, like Alan was saying, do what creates your art because it's your passion to do. You know, it's nothing wrong with taking a job that's outside of what it is that you do as long as it doesn't go against your morals. But you got into it because you did it for your love, and I would say continue to do it because you love what you do. So thank you.